green. Um, should I have that? Just is, the, uh, uh, I have one that, original and then a five. Uh, that is uh, Brian uh, Barry. Ms. Dean, welcome to House Education. I, I will say you, you indicated five to ten minutes. I hope you could uh, limit it to three. I'm a lawyer and you want me to limit my yes, work? Yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. And a woman, that's a double, you know, so. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Penny Dean and I live in Concord, New Hampshire. And I'm an attorney. We can't hear you. Oh, sir. that's right. The booth. <laughs> Sorry. I want everyone to write this down. They couldn't hear me. I wasn't talking loud enough. <laughs> I, my name is Penny Dean, and I live in Concord, New Hampshire. And I'm an attorney. I'm licensed in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, D.C. Circuit, admitted to all the federal courts. And I do a fair amount of firearm law. And I'm also an instructor in many areas as well, um, both the mechanical firearms and the actual self-defense. And I would ask you to I, ITL HB 101. There's several reasons. First of all, there are those that hate guns. They feel uncomfortable around guns and that we use any excuse to ban guns. They simply don't like them. It's not based on logic. And the only thing I can think of is a statement my father once said, is so much education yet so little knowledge. And that's really what we have when I hear people talk about this type of thing. And I would respectfully direct the committee to a couple of very famous works that are well-respected, well-educated. One is by Wright and Rossi. They're two sociologists, and they went into the prisons and they asked prisoners, why do you commit crimes? How do you pick your victims? And they said quite logically, we go to places like Massachusetts where hardly anybody can have a concealed carry license, but places like New Hampshire, oh, no, 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 no. We don't know which one has a firearm. And it reminds me of what the Japanese said, a firearm behind every blade of grass. And so you have to look at this logically, and if the problem they're trying to solve is violence in the schools, you're not going to solve it. And I brought today a book that I would commend to anyone in education to purchase and read. It's the only one like it that I've seen. It's excellent. It's called Countering the Mass Shooter Threat, a comprehensive playbook for every house of worship, school, business, and family in America. And it's written by a man by, named Michael Martin. And I don't know the man, but it is an academic tour de force. It's a fabulous, fabulous book, and it looks at facts, not theory, not emotion, facts. So I would respectfully say that the facts are that this is not going to solve the problem. But then the second thing I'm looking at here is the practical effect of this law. And that is, how is this going to be enforced? And I look at this as a lawyer from a defense point of view, because this covers knives, ammunition, firearm components, and firearms. Firearm components are defined everywhere as powder, primers, and brass. If a person goes to the range and forgets one brass casing that falls out of their bag coming back, and they go into a quote-unquote now gun-free school zone, they're in violation. But here's what's more important. Is this going to give police a basis to check your car? What if I have a shooting sports foundation sticker or a variety of stickers on my car and I'm driving in, into a school? Do they think now they get to search my car because that's a basis. But here's the other practical thing. I've lived in Concord for 23 years, and I used to be a distance runner. And about a mile up the street from my house is Concord High School, and my property borders the McCullough School. So when I go behind my fence in the yard, I call it a yard, it's a strip of grass that no one maintains but us neighbors, I pick up the trash and everything else and pull the weeds, I wouldn't be able to do it now because if they chose to regulate it, I couldn't go back there with my firearm. But here's what's more important. Even if a person wanted to stay out of those zones, I've lived in Concord for 23 years. I cannot tell you the boundary of every school property in Concord. And I respectfully suggest no one else can either, other than maybe a maintenance group. Right up the street was a parking lot for years. It's on Warren Street. It didn't have a sign, but it was a Concord High School parking lot. Now they have signs, but they didn't have signs. So what if you turned around there and you're carrying a firearm? You're looking at all the law-abiding people becoming criminals. What about the ball field in the summer that's on Fruit Street? I don't see signs there, and there are tons of adult men's baseball leagues that play there. 
What if those guys are also shooters and after the day at the range they go play baseball? There's no signs there saying that's Concord School property. So I respectfully say to you the practical application of this poorly worded and poorly conceived thing is horrendous. It's going to take a lot of state tax dollars ultimately to defend people if they can't afford an attorney. And you're looking at a void for vagueness challenge unless are you going to have every property that school property put up signs every 50 feet like you have to do for no trespassing? Ask yourself if you like that look. And ask yourself if the bottom line is will this solve a problem? And I respectfully suggest it will make people less safe. And again, you know, I commend several publications to you, and I would ask that you ITL 101. Uh, thank you. If you have any written testimony, make sure that we uh, give it up to you both with our clerks or the other. Thank you, sir. Thank I, you. I never have written testimony. I always give people cards if they have questions. I'm happy because sometimes committee members don't have expertise, and I'm always happy to help them. Are there things. questions of the presenter? Thank you very much, Ms. Dean. Rock TV.